Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, as I like to say at the start of these webinars, uh, depending on where you're joining in from. Uh, a very warm welcome to all of you on uh, the next edition of our webinar uh, series that we run uh, roughly about twice a month. Um, so let's get started. Uh, today's webinar, the topic is Untangling Business Processes Through the Kanban Lens, uh, brought to you by Sub Kanban from Digite. Uh, let's get started while I can see more people joining in. I will go ahead and get uh, started on the agenda. So we'll start with some introductions, uh, a quick introduction to Digite and Sub Kanban, and then I will hand over the session to our speaker today, Dr. Andy Carmichael, uh, to run us through his session on untangling business processes through the Kanban lens. And uh, after the session is done, we will have a uh, Q&A session and hopefully have a good discussion based on the questions that you uh, have on the topic. Um, just so you know, the webinar is being recorded and we will make the recording available to you in a follow-up email uh, in a day or two after the webinar. Uh, we will take questions uh, using the Q questions box that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, uh, please go ahead and ask the question at any time. Um, if needed, we can take the question during the session, but most likely uh, we will take up the questions at the end of the session once uh, Andy is uh, finished with his talk. Uh, and uh, hopefully we will have, like I said, uh, a good set of questions to pose to Andy. Um, so with that, uh, uh, to introduce uh, our speaker, uh, Andy Carmichael is Managing Director and Principal Trainer at Huge IO. Uh, my name is Mahesh Singh. I'm uh, responsible for marketing and consulting at Digite uh, and have been with the company since uh, we started our business. Um, a little bit, bit more about Andy. I've uh, been privileged to know Andy for a really long time. I think since the time we started our Kanban journey way back in 2010 and uh, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and honor to uh, uh, interact with him, uh, do these webinars with him and collaborate with him on other areas. Uh, he's a very well-known consultant, coach, uh, trainer in Kanban. He's uh, uh, co-authored the Essential Kanban Condensed Book along with David Anderson uh, uh, in 2016. And uh, uh, he's simply a, a you know amazing uh, mentor, manager, uh, business builder, uh, you know, just a deep uh, uh, level of experience that he draws upon to help uh, the customers and companies that he works with. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, we have uh, had the pleasure of hosting uh, Andy uh, not only on these webinars but also in conferences. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, like like I said, uh, just uh, great to know him. Andy, a very warm welcome. <coughs> um, I will, uh, yeah, I will. I will. I will hand over the session to you in just a few seconds. Uh, let me just quickly. Uh, for those of you who may not know Digite or Swift Kanban uh, too much, uh, just a quick introduction. Uh, uh, Digite has been a pioneer in the, in the uh, area of uh, uh, agile application lifecycle management, project management, uh, software development tooling uh, for the, for nearly two decades now. Uh, we are headquartered here in Cupertino, California, which is where I'm based, uh, and we have nearly a million users of our products around the world. Uh, Swift Kanban and Swifties are our main offerings for uh, Kanban, Scrum, Scale Agile, whatever be the uh, uh, agile framework that you might be implementing within an organization and if you're looking at tools uh, or evaluating tools I'd love to have you uh, come take a look at these as well. Um, uh, just a little bit about our Swift Kanban tool. Uh, while our predominant customer base is I would say uh, IT and uh, software engineering uh, but we do have a fair bit of usage outside of that in the manufacturing, product design, marketing, legal, HR, all kinds of functions uh, and of course a lot of personal Kanban application as well. Uh, one of the key things that the people uh, like about Swift Kanban is our ability for portfolio and uh, enterprise Kanban uh, capability that we provide, especially with our add-on module uh, uh, on enterprise services planning, uh, where we again collaborated with Andy besides a few other people to build some of that functionality. So we have the ability to define, help you define you know, portfolio Kanban boards uh, and have them connected to lower level exec uh, execution boards. Uh, we provide a sort of complete uh, customizable hierarchy that you can build based on your own uh, uh, sort of work nomenclature. Uh, and the uh, the enterprise services planning module gives you the ability to do risk and demand shaping, et cetera, and help uh, decide which are the work, which are the work items or which are the project initiatives that you will take up next. 
and we provide a, a whole range of uh, forecasting uh, capabilities including things that are based on the Monte Carlo simulation based method to help you uh, become a more predictable more reliable uh, team uh, to your customers uh, we have a ton of uh, analytics that support the Kanban method uh, which again are uh, something for which we are well known for um, one of the things that we are uh, uh, you know uh, known for also is our range of integration that we provide through a variety of different integration tools in order for you to integrate with your existing tooling that you might have uh, in your project management or ALM environment and uh, we get used by customers around the world a wide range of companies from tens of users to tens of thousands of uh, users uh, of our uh, products around the world so just a quick uh, introduction to Digitair there uh, before I hand over to Andy, I had a quick question. We had a quick question for you just to understand who's on the uh, on the webinar today. So if you could just respond to this poll and let us know how familiar you are with the Kanban method. What's your level of experience with Kanban? That'd be really great. Um, and uh, that way, Andy also has an idea of uh, <coughs> who the audience is. And uh, uh, you know, we can uh, discuss, it, discuss the topic today in that context. Uh, so just a few more seconds here. All right. Oh, there you go, Andy. So you have the results. Uh, about 20%, 22% just getting started. Uh, about 40, 45% who are already uh, well on the way to using Kanban. And then, of course, 30% who are uh, there, uh, right up there. <laughs> All right. So with that, I'll hand over the session to Andy. Andy, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, looking forward to your talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. So do I need to uh, press anything to share my screen? I guess I do. Uh, yes, you do. You need to share your screen, yeah. <laughs> uh, and hopefully uh, that will come up in a moment and you can see my screen. Um, very interesting yeah. poll you got there, Mahesh. And um, I was just wondering what I would answer to that because um, I do coach for a living, but then <laughs> I also feel I'm just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, okay. it's, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? That, um, yep uh yeah uh where are we on that that whole whole thing okay so thank you very much for that very um, generous welcome and um i wanted to share in the session just um it's it's a little bit of a an experience report uh I've worked with a client that, uh, recently that has brought these these thoughts to the to the fore um and the theme that i've hung it on is this idea of untangling business processes through the Kanban lens. So it gives me to an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is the Kanban lens, a very simple summary of Kanban, but actually it covers a broad, uh, a broad uh, scope of what Kanban is, um, is involved in from um, the organization of processes at the um, uh, at the corporate scale, at the uh, uh, the whole company scale, as well as um, helping teams um, deal with the throughput of their work um, on a daily basis. So, um, and linking that to something that's discovered with this client really is that the tangle of business processes that we often have to get through to actually see um, how work is being delivered in an organisation. So um let's um let's start in on that so when you look at um business processes you often find that they're this tangle um multiple processes multiple parties involved complex interactions um loops things going around the same part of the process again and again conditional paths parallel paths and so on and um it is it reflects the, the complexity in the real world of working with um, many people in different organisations collaborating together to get to get work done. In contrast, um, in Kanban, workflows are primarily seen as a one-directional flow from the need of the customer, a request for um, support, for example, through to the point that they get their needs met. And it's the mapping between these two aspects that, that interests me and certainly interests me with this particular client. So 
Yeah, this is a very old joke, a very old cartoon, so I won't, I won't dwell on it. You know, but you draw these very complicated, complicated diagrams, and you find there's one box on that diagram, which you've no idea how it works. Yeah, that uh, often happens. <laughs> so uh, here we are um, looking at um, uh, this process. It is in a large, a large hospital. Not actually this one in the picture, but. Um, um, an, NH, an NHS hospital. So in the UK, a um, uh, so a government-funded, uh, government-owned hospital um, as part of the health service, national health service. And um, this particular part of the organisation is responsible for delivering IT. So you get IT requests from a large number of places, um, and these requests. Um, come in two categories by and large the standard ones which we know how much those cost by and large if you want a printer if you want a standard laptop if you want a lap uh, if you want a, um, a tablet for logging in um, patients to a ward these are standard things we know how much they cost you you get the budget you get a purchase order and you get it delivered to you so these are less interesting from a process point of view um, but they're still very important. They're still part of the overall delivery of IT um, from the company. So the same, the same group of people by and large are responsible. The things that uh, get tied in are not very often the custom requests, the ones which are, you know, we don't know how much they're going to cost. We don't know um, exactly what it is that the, the user needs. Um, so we need to find that out. We need to work out how much it's going to cost and then we need to deliver it. And when you look at who delivers that and who's responsible for it, well, there's more than one organization, not more than just more than one person. There's, there are multiple departments involved here. There's the IT department of the hospital. Um, and these um, is a smaller department than it used to be because they've got a delivery subcontractor that actually does the delivery of the IT. But they're responsible for the um, the architecture of the infrastructure, the the standards to which they that they apply. They're aware of um, what the direction of travel for IT in the in the organisation is. And there's also the customer authority, and they're involved in just choosing where money gets spent on IT, and is this in the right direction, and how is it done, and of course finance. Um, you know, very much. Um, uh, the name of the game in, a, in an organization like the NHS is is saving money because uh, uh, it, there's not profit um, from it. The profit goes to the the community as a whole in terms of the health of the nation, we hope. Um, but um, there's always pressure on finance, of course, in these, these circumstances. So all these organizations are involved, even in quite a simple um, uh, request such as um, you know, opening a new ward or changing the um, the network in um, in one of the buildings or whatever. So all these things come down to this interaction between all these people. And so the custom request process, first of all, it is, and this uh, we might, uh, if we have time, <laughs> We could talk about the fact that it's a fixed price contractual model, because I think that's the source of uh, significant problems in a lot of situations. Um, but fixed price means that you have to understand what is required by the user, and then you give them a, a producer spec, and then you get a, um, get a quote from the subcontractor of how much that's going to cost. All through the process, it's dominated by handoffs and multiple sign-offs by the requester, by the customer authority, by the IT department, etc. So there's all these um, organisations involved at the same time, and we we want to get to that point where we understand what we do at the moment. One of the principles, as uh, you may know, certainly if you've read um, Essential Kanban Condensed, of course, I have a copy on the desk here. But uh, one of the principles on the cover here is, um, in fact, the first change management principle of Kanban, start with what you do now. So can we understand how um, these customer requests are, um, are dealt with in the organization? And so um, various people get involved, they have workshops together to understand what's involved between the requester of the, uh, the IT request, 
the subcontractor who's going to deliver it, the IT department who are responsible for standards and for, uh, uh, for and and also to some extent in actually defining what the requirements are for the request and so on. So here's one of those examples of a tangled web um, of business processes. Um, that's only part of it. Here's the processing and closure part of it, where we actually get through to oh, at the end of the day, the last blue box here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but there it is, invoice on the right hand side. That's uh, that's the end of the process of, yeah, we've delivered it, the customer's accepted it, and here's an invoice. So there's quite a lot of work just understanding what the business processes are. Now, the first job of Kanban is not necessarily to re start redrawing what the business processes are. As I said, we start from what we do now. We start from where we are. And it's this the whole idea of actually looking at the work in a different way that is going to lead to a process of continuous improvement. So not necessarily wanting to rip these diagrams up, how do we move to a Kanban system? Um, well, I want to tell you what not to do first of all. So um, there's a great te uh, temptation once you've <laughs> once you've gone through the, uh, uh, the you've gone through the process of understanding what that process is. There's a temptation to directly translate it into a Kanban system. This is the sort of thing that can can happen, and um, that you. Okay, so th this looks looks like a Kanban board. We can see that there are tickets and the tickets are moving and they're moving from left to right. And, you know, we'll, we'll see as we go through. What you also find in a board like this is that tickets move backwards. Now, one of the problems with tickets moving backwards is that we don't really know where we are with um, all the tickets that are in process and there may be hundreds of them. So, um, we want to avoid just taking those um, those process views of things. We hand off to this person, we hand off to that person, and draw columns that correspond um, to those individual people. Another problem with this is that this is, of course, only a little bit of it. And when we look a bit deeper, we find, yeah, well, there's the next part of this. And we've also got waiting for approval, approving, and approved in that one. And then there's maybe we look at it. Um, I have. Uh, one example of a colleague who said that they they did this with um, uh, one of the first systems that they implemented in this company, and they ended up with a Kanban board with 26 columns on it. And you say, well, yeah, we're starting with what we do now. These are all the approval processes. These are all the steps that we go through to get from um, what the client asked for to finally giving them the system that. Uh, uh, gives them what they need. This is not really helpful. It's not really, in a sense, it's not really using the power of Kanban to bring management over complex um, situations. And there's an alternative. And um, the way that I like to explain it is um, this thing called the Kanban lens. Um, and what is the Kanban lens? Well, um, it's, it's quite straightforward, really. The Kanban lens is a way to look at work. It's a way to see. And that different way of seeing, a different way of looking at the work and the workflow and the services we're delivering and the organization we deliver them in, that different way of looking transforms, has the potential to transform the effectiveness of the management of that work. And there are four parts to the Kanban lens. And the first one sounds really obvious, um, but it's, a, it's probably the most important one, is to stop seeing work as the busyness of our activities, the, the things that we do between nine and five. In fact, um, you know, as my, my grandchildren ask me, um, you know, what, what do I do for a living? The answer probably is, well, I go to meetings and I do email. Um, what is the purpose of what I'm doing? What is the the aspect behind it. The way that transforms our, our view of what we're doing is where we see a customer need going through a series of, of stages to the point where that need is fulfilled. And that is the crucial element of seeing workers flow. 
The second part of the lens is to see workflow as knowledge discovery steps. It's this sequence of activities that results in value to the customer. So this is really looking at the process side. And it's probably the, the sort of focus of this, of this talk really is that second step of seeing workflow as knowledge discovery steps. So I'll say some more about that. Um, the third part is to see knowledge work as a service. And again, we can, we can be fooled by um, the way we look at our work and we look at our job, whatever. Our job is really to fulfill the needs of the customer. And when we see that, that and we see who the customer is, what are the um, impediments to actually the, the work flowing through and the value flowing through to the end customer, that is the crucial element of, um, of what we're doing. So knowledge work is a general phrase invented by Drucker, knowledge work. The, the fact that we use knowledge, we are primarily working with knowledge rather than with physical uh, products even though they, they come into the delivery, of course, but it's the knowledge and the knowledge work, the, 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 the um, uh, gathering of information and use of information within the work items that makes it knowledge work. And finally, to see organizations as network of services. So you see this little summary of the Kanban lens and how we see differently, how we want to change that way that we look in Kanban. Um, it covers from the very small item of, um, you know, a nurse on a ward needs a laptop um, or the network port has stopped working in this ward. From that point, we're, we're changing around and, and those small work items, which are our flow of work when we report to the, of a fault to a fix, through to actually seeing the whole organization as a, a network of services. So different um, groups and different um, organizations within the overall organization are responsible for services and the network of services and how they deliver value to each other results in um, value to the end client or the end customer. So I find that is a really useful summary. And um, you know, if you're stuck in a lift with someone and want to explain Kanban, that might be uh, you know, a way that you can start because you're looking at those four elements the work itself, seeing the work as items, the workflow, um, how what the process is behind that work, um, knowledge work itself as a general um, thing, and actually seeing knowledge work, and most of us are involved in knowledge work rather than physical work by and large, um, seeing that as a service, a service to customers, and of course how we organize organizations. So, um, Kanban has always been a scaling method, has always been um, a way of looking at more than just a team um, delivering um, software or um, uh, service tickets or whatever it is in your in the service. It, um, it goes through from the scale of an individual to the scale of the whole organization. So, um, so how do we apply this? Well, well, first of all, a little bit more on seeing workers flow because there's more than one aspect to it. There is this aspect of flow what, from what to what, from customer need to the needs being met. There's also the aspect of the flow because it's individual items that are flowing through this process. The individual items need to be small enough, granular enough, and they need to be coherent means of giving value to the customer. So it's not just I can break down the overall job that I've got to do into lots of different tasks, I can actually say, giving the customer this part of it um, actually moves them forward, actually gives them value. And having granular items means that we can look at the delivery of, say, um, open a new ward in the hospital, which involves many different IT activities. Um, or one of the things that happened when I was there um, in January this year, um, uh, they, it would have been February, um, is that they suddenly had a request from the government to build a COVID ward. And um, they wanted it to, uh, you know, work from when they want to start work to uh, bring in the porter cabins that where the, the, um, the ward would be and through to opening it, they wanted that to be two weeks. Well, that's a, that's a tough challenge. And then, and a lot of the, the, 
the limitations on whether they can do that was the IT requests. So those kinds of um, you know, seeing actually delivering something that can be broken down into a series of granular work items um, that can be delivered where value is being uh, given to the customer in each, in each case. So how do we apply that in our context? So taking this, um, this part of the process, for example, and how, how do we actually address the issue of untangling this into something that would make coherent sense as work flowing from the customer need to the um, delivery? So here's a hand-drawn um, part of process of tr translating that. Uh, and the swim lanes across here, these, these horizontal lines, are representing the different parts of the organizations um, that um, the different um, parts of the organization that actually are responsible for delivering it. So you've got the requester um, that um, raises the request, but is also involved in uh, validating the requirements and uh, clarifying what they need through to accepting it at the end of the day. You've got the subcontractor, you've got the IT department, the customer authority and so on, and the finance de department who raised the, the purchase order. So um, just looking at this line, we can begin to see that series of steps um, from the raise request through to scoping what it is, this rough order of magnitude um, of um, what's involved in this request, a detailed design effectively the statement of work, implementing and testing it through to customer accepting it. So we begin to see this as a, as a reasonable flow. Um, and so that can inform how, we, how we're gonna start to think about a Kanban system um, from lots of detailed interactions through to a very simple set of steps, um, which define the work, um, the flow from the request to delivery, the stages of what we're gonna go through and the stages, say what we go through, is the stages that the work item goes through to clarify um, uh, what the process is, focusing on the work item rather than focusing on the workers. So um, this is something like the sort of first, um, uh, first iteration of looking at yeah, this is something like what the, the Kanban board or the Kanban system underlying whatever the, um, the tools um, or physical boards that might be used in re representing it, what we might be looking at. Um, so the various stages that they go through, uh, acknowledging that there are discarded um, tickets as we go through this first phase and um, implementing and accepting the, the requests. And this leads on to the next part of the lens, the second half, second part of the Kanban lens, in that um, we're beginning to see this element of the workflow. Now, the Kanban lens says, and uh, these words are often being criticized, so what on earth do you mean by that? See the workflow as a sequence of knowledge discovery steps. And this is in contrast to where we might be tempted to, to start which is the, um, the, the, the customer uh, customer authority, the IT department, the subcontractor, the customer. So the, the handoff between these various groups and these um, different people representing those groups. We don't want to draw Kanban boards and, and implement Kanban systems where the lines on the Kanban system represent the handoff between one person and another. We're trying to get a, a board which represents the knowledge acquisition as a work item starts off from a vague idea, from a vague need of the customer, through to actually saying, well, this is what we'll do. This is how we'll do it. Here it is as we build up through to actually deliver it. And can you check that this is right? And so rather than having just one group of people implement it, it working in each column, we recognize that throughout every stage of the process, as we move this work item from that early stage through, through to delivered, that we're having all those departments represented in some way as we go through each stage. 
Um, and that's a very important insight when we're saying, okay, well, that's what we mean by a workflow in Kanban representing knowledge discovery. Another way of looking at it is to say, well, as we go through these stages, we're adding knowledge to the work item at each at each point. Um, and so he, there's more knowledge gained on each on the on the work item as we finish scoping, as we finish design, as we finish implementation and so on. And that that process of knowledge discovery is what we mean by the state or these sequential states in Kanban that uh, actually um, cover a, a complex domain. So how do we apply this in our context of the, the hospital IT systems? How do we apply work as a sequence of knowledge discovery steps? Well, there are two parts of it, aren't there? There's the sequence element. And we want to make sure that the states that we recognize as the dominant um, states in the, on the Kanban board are a sequence. They're not bouncing responsibilities between one state and another. They are forward flow and they're meaningful states from both the um, requester and the and the implementer of the system. They, they mean something, the milestones between them are something that are relatively, are, are, are easy to identify, or at least are, are meaningful to identify. So the knowledge discovery aspect, um, this, this is also how much work do we do in scoping as opposed to detailed design or producing the statement of work? How much work do we do in that stage as opposed to the implementation? Because it's all a sequence of growing towards the final outcome. I have to tell you, one of the problems that we find here is that the model that they're trying to implement over this process means that the subcontractor doesn't get paid for anything until they have given a quote and that quote has been accepted. And it's only then that they get paid for it. So that subcontractor contractually, at least, is less interested in the front end of the process. Um, and, um, you know, that's that's problematic in terms of how this works. Um, so the contractual framework um, really does um, affect how agile, in a sense, you can be with this process because of, of those aspects. So the customer part of the organization, the IT department, the customer authority have a lot more work to do up front um, that then allows the subcontractor to, to quote um, realistically for the work and, um, and move ahead and do it. So the, the, the two elements that we're applying, uh, you know, from the second half of the lens is the sequence and forward flow that we see in a Kanban board as opposed to more, more complex and tangled we, uh, web of, of interactions that we see in a process diagram um, and ensuring that we are aware of the, the knowledge which is needed and the knowledge which is acquired in each work item as we move from stage to stage. So back to my hand-drawn diagram here. Um, uh, certainly don't want to talk about the detail, but the there are two elements to, to what we're doing. There's the uh, organizations or the roles, the request to the subcontractor, the IT department, and so on down here, which give us the swim lanes in this um, in this diagram. And then sort of superimposed on it, the stages of the Kanban board, the Kanban system. From we've received the request, we've we're uh, an assessment, we're doing solution design, we're doing implementation, and so on. And the combination of the two is just a way of looking at this whole uh, aspect of bringing together the complex business process with a linear monotonic process in Kanban, which allows us to manage it in an effective manner. So um, that. Uh, it seemed to me a, a, a useful way that we could look at both the both aspects. Now, the, the crucial thing when you look at this diagram, you realize, well, we've got to have during the assessment period or the scoping phase, we've got to have interaction between the customer and the subcontractor and the IT department and the customer authority in which we can get through to, yes, this is the item that we want to do next. And 
uh, we want to to work that up into a detailed design and um, from here where we've got the detailed design we've got the quote we then move ahead and implement it so um, you can see that um, in each of these stages there are multiple organizations involved in actually delivering it and this this highlights the the need for the client to make those interactions work effectively as we'll see when we look at some of the um, the data we get out of this this system we'll see some of the problems that occur um, so here we are back in this this aspect okay um, we've, we've got the stages identified scoping solution design etc um, we've got the request point where the request starts and we've got the delivery point so we can begin to talk about the kinds of um, metrics that we want to gather the kinds of data that we want from the system to tell us for example that first one up there how long does the customer wait um, on average and for each individual item can we get that data out of our systems to show us we requested it on this date and we actually had the system up and running and being in use on use in the ward on this date that is what we call customer lead time. It's a very important part of this, of the fitness for purpose of the whole service. How long do people have to wait? And also the customer satisfaction metrics come out of this as well. If you have to wait a long time for something which you know doesn't take very long to do, customers are not satisfied with the service. Um, now, there's some, some little letters on, on the slide as well, the time and scoping, the time and solution design, the time in, in implementation, the time acceptance. Why are those there? Well, when we realize that the customer lead time is too long, that this is causing not just dissatisfaction from the customer's point of view, but real loss of value in the overall work and, in, and increasing cost as well, because all the management activity goes on, um, the delays in terms of uh, you know, also cause um, the requester to actually have to do more work to overcome it and so on. So where these, where the customer lead time is too long, we've got to look at these parts of it of where are these delays in the, in the process occurring. Um, another, another thing um, to look at is this, this diagram is, we initially uh, labeled this as the commitment point on um, on the Kanban board. And if you're familiar with um, Kanban, if you've been using it for a while, you realize that the commitment point is a really Im important aspect of Kanban systems. Um, and what is the commitment point there for? It's basically there to protect expensive bottleneck processes from wastage and from delays. We basically, when we get to the commitment point, we know what we're going to do. We know we're going to do it and we're going to carry it through. And then we want a smooth flow, flow as possible from the commitment point through to delivery. And so, um, you know, one, one aspect of uh, about that, you could say the commitment point is there to protect the bottleneck process. It's somewhere downstream of the commitment point. We'll come back to that point and that may be something you want to ask about if I don't cover it in detail, but um, um, an important aspect. Uh, is where is the commitment point in your process so we're getting to really not the end of the of the story here but the beginning all we have done at this point is understood what the business process is and simplified it into a kanban system where we have a series of states which all work items or the, you know, there may be conditional states, not everything goes through detailed design, for example, but we, um, we have a series of states which work items go through um, from, from the request to the delivery. And now we can look at what is happening in our system. And until you've got a simple process, finding out the date on which you know okay the subcontractor passed it to the it department they passed it to the customer authority they passed it back to the customer on these dates that is not giving us the same quality of information of what time that pass these key processes so now we've got a starting point we can look at the data that the system gives us and we can ask the question well which metrics matter to us this one I'm gonna, you know, where is the bottleneck? I'll, I'll postpone that for a while, but let's look at some of the data that um, very early on we were able to get out of um, the system and look at what's going on. Because 
you may guess that the customer wasn't totally delighted with how the system was working. This is, uh, and uh, you, you can see some of that from these, um, from these graphs. So I'm gonna show you two typical graphs, this one and this one. This is a scatter plot of lead times, and this is the cumulative flow chart. And if you're familiar with Kanban, you will be familiar with these charts, but if, if you're new to it, there are two charts which you must understand and they're not altogether straightforward to understand immediately, particularly the cumulative flow chart, um, stripey charts. Um, it's really important that you've got a tool that is able, like I would have to say Swift Kanban, a tool like that, which is able to draw a cumulative flow diagram in a sensible manner. Because, because we're looking at monotonic flow from the raising of a request through to delivery, we can expect cumulative flow diagrams to be always with a positive gradient, gradient to the right, increasing day by day as we go from date one to date two, et cetera. There's an increase both in the arrival rate, this, the, the line of um, uh, tickets arriving in the system, as well as the black one here, the tickets being delivered to customers. And there's this red section here, which is all the ones that are being cancelled between um, when they were raised or not. And since the first one was cancelled about um, in this date, halfway through this time period, um, you know, you these are items that are at least this old <laughs> before they get cancelled. So this is also about a bit. It's not a bad thing that um, work items get cancelled. What is a bad thing? is if it takes a long time to cancel them. Um, that we don't want to, you know, oh, we can't afford this work, we don't want to do this work, um, it won't do the job, we discover that as soon as possible and then we can cancel the ticket, that's not a problem. The other thing is that you will notice from this is that the arrival rate, once the system gets going, the arrival rate is, um, is, is here, the delivery rate is here, the, the gradient between those two lines is diverging very rapidly and the only way we can keep the number of tickets in the system down to a reasonable level is to keep cancelling them i think this little step here corresponds to about christmas when they realize we're never going to do this stuff we need to cancel them so straight away we're seeing by just by having a system where we can really just look at in this case we're only looking at um uh, two dates really, the date an item came into the system and the date it exited either by being cancelled or by being delivered. And there's a lot of things that we can discover from that. Um, as the, the day, as we run the system that we've designed, more data will come out in terms of those intermediate phases as well and we can look at that. So cumulative flow chart. Um, the second one is the customer lead times. Um, and again, um, I took quite a lot of data off these charts just um, to protect the innocent as well as the guilty. Um, but in a sense, we need to you know, sort of look at average lead time is 76, 79 days. One of the things I wanted to show you here is the importance of not just looking at average lead time, which only tells you the lead time of items which have been delivered. It doesn't tell you about the, the items which are in the system but haven't been delivered yet. And that's why the average age of WIP is also, and also the, the, in a more detail of the, of the age of WIP, this is how long items have been in the system. And we can see here that, um, well, it's more than double um, lead time. In a stable system, we would expect the average age of WIP to be about half the average lead time. If, if it's a stable system, not, not trending. Um, and so we can see here, although the average lead time is 79 days, it's going to get worse. Inevitably, it's going to get worse because um, the age of the items in, um, in progress is getting on for um, seven to nine months. So, you know, we're in trouble. <laughs> We're in trouble, but we can, uh, by being able to see this stuff, this is a, just having a lot of detail of when things was passed to so-and-so may tell you who was to blame for these delays, but it doesn't tell you the key things you do is 
where do we need to start? Where do we need to start putting things right? Okay, another another chart which is important is looking at the delivery rate, and you can see in the, so you can see this on the cumulative flow diagram. There's a period of very low um, delivery rate, and then things pick up to a, um, a more uh, reasonable delivery rate um, on there. You can see on this the scatter plot and the scatter plot of lead time and the cumulative flow diagrams are less good at highlighting particular elements that we um, want to look at. So if we're interested in terms of how many items do we do a week, the um, the average delivery rate is a good one to, to plot. It's a run chart. And what we mean by run chart is that the x-axis is date, so we can see how these things are changing over time. And then the, um, the particular metric that we're interested in looking at is on the y-axis. So we can see you know, low, low initial delivery rate, uh, it, it rapidly increases and then it reaches another um, plateau here. So we can see a little bit about that and then we can ask the question is what was happening there. If you look at the Essential Kanban condensed book, there are a number of run charts shown in that, um, including obviously the, the, um, the run chart of, of lead times, average lead times, um, the run chart of delivery rates like the one we've just seen, the run chart of the whip, and again, the age of whip, how long have, have items been in there? There are two lines on here. The, the top line is the oldest item, and, and the line underneath is, um, an, is an average, a rolling average. So um, run charts are a very important uh, way of seeing what's going on. So we've we've reached this point where we can ask the question, well, where do we go from here? Um, because as I mentioned, we've only just started um, a little bit like my, my, uh, my response to that survey. Where where am I? Well, I coach for a living, but I'm just started. I'm just getting started on this to understand um, what are the typical problems that we're, we're, we need to solve. So we can ask how the system will evolve. What we hope from that initial phase, um, and in this case, we did a static workshop. Those of you who've done the Kanban training for Kanban management professional will know that the static process, system thinking approach to introducing Kanban is a, is a framework for a, for a workshop, um, which can be over one or two days, some, something like that, where you look at the system, um, hopefully with some preparation so you've got data to inform it, are you looking at what's the current system? What are the problems that we have with it? What's the pattern of demand? How many of these requests do we get every week or every month? Um, and how are we able to cope? And what's the capability of the, of the service that we have to fulfill those needs? So doing something like that, we can get to this initial point where we've got a Kanban system and we're getting the data which will tell us what to do next. That's the, the key message. So as well as using the Kanban lens to see what we should be doing and how to define this workflow, we're using the data as a way to see into the system and what's going on. Uh, hopefully some of these, you know, the dominant activities, for example, is reasonably stable. This might change. We might find actually there's a stage we missed out or there's a different way of looking at this, this flow from um, need to needs met. But these are hopefully reasonably stable. These milestones are not particularly related to the process that we've introduced for Kanban. These are milestones of when um, the subcontractor gave us a, doc a document to define the, the design, where the finance department gave us an order that they could actually start work when the customer received the work. So these, these milestones are actually things which, even if we change the process frantically, um, we should still be able to report on those milestones so that the data over a longer period of time is going to be relevant to us to help us what's next. There are still questions, and I, um, I said I'd mention bottlenecks again. One of the things that we, we, we did talk about quite a lot is where is the commitment point in the system? I mentioned to you that, you know, if you ask the finance department, we're committed to do this work once we give the subcontractor a purchase order. And so this Hand, um, handing them purchase order is, is represents the commitment point. 
But when we looked at the system in terms of where the bottleneck is, the bottleneck was not the implementation uh, part of the process. Where tickets were getting stuck is in the scoping and the solution design and the quotation part, possibly and the raising the purchase order, but that's where work is getting stuck. Once they got a purchase order, they they flowed through this part of the system reasonably well, not not faultlessly, not that we couldn't improve this. But if we only focus on improving this, we're not really addressing those very long customer lead times that we had to deal with. So we have to look further upstream. And that means this commitment point here, if you're defining this is the commitment point and this is the this this is the Kanban system and the system lead time, it's not really addressing the problem. We need to protect this bottleneck and actually look at the resourcing at the upstream part or upstream of the purchase order to ensure that we can see what is, is happening and we can make sure that once we decide to go ahead with a solution design, for example, we put the commitment point there, that then we've got flow through fast from, okay, we've done the, the solution design, we've got that sorted, we can get a purchase order and we can do the implementation. And there are business problems about doing that um, in terms of how we deal with the, with the subcontractor and so on. So these are all questions that come out of it from that very early part we've done. Yeah. I'm going to interrupt you just briefly here because you're talking about something specific on the board and I couldn't see it and I see a couple of other people uh, remarking that they couldn't see your mouse. So when you said this, what did you mean? And I <laughs> you're talking about the PO stage of the Kanban board, but just... Uh, I'm waving my mouse at a completely wrong part of the screen. Right. And this is my last slide. So, so you know, I think um, <laughs> I'm very happy to come to questions. And uh, if I didn't make that clear where I was, here's the PO. Okay, there you go. <laughs> being, being, being done. So I must remember to wave my mouse at the right part of the screen. Um, uh, you know, we, we're at a point where we can take questions and where I can draw this to a close um, and say thank you to all of you that, that have attended and have, have been with us for this time. Um, there are a few uh, references and credits on the final slide, and I will pass these to Mahesh to um, to distribute if, the, if there's interest in in looking again at the slides. Um, but, um, you know, thank you very much for that. And thank you for um, for listening. I hope it's I hope it's um, opened up some some ideas in terms of how you look at Kanban, how, Kanban systems, how you look, use the Kanban lens um, as a way of um, focusing on those key aspects of introducing a Kanban system. Um, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, for Mahesh, for pointing out uh, that particular point, and a good point to do so as we're we're drawing to a close. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Uh, no, no, that is, uh, so I was I was wondering whether I should mention it or not. But thanks to Sarah, who's on the call, uh, I decided to go ahead and ask the question anyway. So, okay. uh, firstly, uh, you know, as always, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure many people on the call feel that way. Uh, that just when you think that you uh, you really understand Kanban. Yeah, you know, comes along Andy and explains things in such a amazing way that you realize that there is so much more to still learn and to observe about uh, uh, you know Kanban systems and processes and people that we are uh, that we're working with and and understand it at a deeper level, understand it even better. So fabulous session. Thanks for uh, thanks for that. Um, I, there are a few questions that have come in. Uh, the folks, if you have more questions, uh, please go ahead and use the questions box on the right side of your screen to. Uh, to uh, ask any other questions, um, uh, Andy, I'm going to start with one part, which is uh, which is important when you look at work as flow, and you're trying to um, you're trying to uh, you know uh, design the system in such a way that you can observe the flow. And you said something about uh, the work needing to be granular enough, and mm. I've seen enough people struggle with that aspect, which is how do you make sure that the the tickets that you're designing to flow on a Kanban board, are they granular enough? Are they too are they are they too high level or are they too low level? And so on the on the one hand, you might not see the flow, uh, you might not see something mm -hmm. move for months between one column and the other. And on the other hand, you might get to too low level tasks where you're seeing a ton of things happening on the board, but then it's impossible to uh, get meaningful data out of that. So do you have any advice there in terms of how do you you know achieve that right yes. level of that? So 
I, I think the two, the two points on that slide is is where that it has to be granular, but it has to be valuable. You know, so we think of it as a present wrapped up for the customer. And when he unwraps it, does he have something that's of any use to him? Or is it just a, you know, a bolt, which has got to be screwed into a machine or something, isn't it? It's, it, it, you can get down to things which are too small and saying, look, look, I finished, I finished the spec of um, part of what you wanted. Yeah, but I, that's not what I want. I want the actual thing, not the spec. You know, so um, we have to look at delivery of stuff which is valuable. That's one thing. And that has a natural thing to make things bigger. So the government comes along and says, I want a COVID ward. And I want it now, you know, as soon as you can. Um, and, you know, you've got to get the, the porter cabins in there. You've got to get the ventilators. You've got to get the beds. You've got to get the nurses. You've got, et cetera, et cetera. And, you, the, you know, you've got to have the network and so on. This is too big. Um, to actually see this as flow, to actually see progress through, even over a short period of time in weeks, to actually see that that ward open. So it has to be smaller than that. Sometimes I think you can just say, and this is certainly true in software products, is that we don't consider a um, an epic or a feature that we want to put into product if it's not smaller than this, whether that's in um, you know person months or um, or number of user stories, or um, however you measure, or, or budget, and saying, you know, if we work it out and it's more than 100 grand, it's too big as a feature that we're going to put in the product. You know, so um, that's a, that's one way to handle it. Saying that we because we want to see things flow, and um, and you know, if that's a rule, um, or there's a totally different process. You know, I mean, this is again. <laughs> Another way they do it. Uh, we found in one of the banks where I was working that uh, there was a process called the small change process, where uh -huh. you could use a more agile process because some of this complex tangle of business process was not actually um, mandated for small change. Oh. And so then there was a motivation for some managers to say, well, let's use the small change process to deliver over a period of months and ultimately years what we want to do in the system we we're saying actually that's the agile process that we would like to introduce in the bank but we can't because there's too much of the infrastructure that we have to change to get there so right. just having a limit on budget or a limit on days or some measure like that you say if yeah. it's bigger than that it's too big um, using the value, actual actual quantum of value to uh, to decide that Yes, or a quantum of cost or, you know, whatever it is, something that just says you can't have it bigger than that, you know, split okay. it into two at least. Okay. Okay, <laughs> great. Uh, so let's take some uh, audience questions. Uh, uh, so there are, I think, a couple of questions from uh, Mansuri, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, uh, which I think are related. So how does Kanban help balance the load of work at each stage so that workers pull the work whenever they're capable of, capable to work on it? Yeah, well, you've you've used some some uh, good words in there that that help us, Mansoor, like pull system. Yeah, we want we want to, um, we we don't want to push work in from the front end on people who've then got the we had a hundred tickets they were working on now they got two hundred. That's not effective, and we'll block the system, stop 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 flow altogether. So to get a pull system. Um, you need some policies which stops work being pushed in. And a simple way that Kanban does it is with a Kanban limit on a column. Mm -hmm. So we, we, you know, if um, you know, there's those Kanban boards that have they had had whip limits, um, and what that does is prevents um, any more work going into that column, um, and therefore you will see the column before that, which needs to be ready for that column um uh, queue that queue gets longer and longer and then you can see hang on a minute we've got a problem and this is how we know that the bottleneck is not in implementation in this particular system because there's no queue in front of implementation once they get a purchase order they do the work but that doesn't mean the work is flowing it just means that that's not the bottleneck and we would like it to be the bottleneck because that's what costs us money as a hospital actually doing the tickets but the, the work is never getting to that because of all the delays, all the sign-offs at the front end of the process. So um, the Kanban system in a sense is revealing it by having a whip limit. 
Um, another easy way to introduce it, if you're, um, you know, if you're doing it with a new system, is just say, here's a policy. We are not allowed to start a new piece of work until we've finished a piece of work. This is sometimes called con whip because the idea is whatever there's the number of tickets that are in process at the moment, we won't have any more than that, right? But it's not saying in which column it is. It's just over the whole system that we're managing, we will not start another piece of work until we've finished a piece of work because we think we've got, at least, you know, you look at that system, you look at that cumulative flow diagram, okay. we've got enough work in progress. <laughs> yeah, so given that we've got enough work in progress, let's just say, we won't start another piece of work till we finish something. And um, I think on my laptop somewhere, I've got a, um, a sticker which says stop starting, start finishing. And that's really to get that whole thing. So that's, that's a way without getting into the, what can sometimes be a rat hole discussion of how many items should I allow in this column, right. put a con whip on as a starting point. And then you can see, um, okay, it causes stress because the people that can't then work say, well, I need to start something else because I've finished everything in my work. Right. What are you going to do in that situation? That's part mm -hmm. of the point of Kanban to get a pull system. Some people are doing wasteful work because they are pushing work downstream where there's no capability downstream to do it. In this case, we have a slightly different situation where we haven't got the, the, um, the bottleneck in downstream of the commitment point we need to move the commitment point up mm -hmm. so there's more filtering of what goes through that early stage of scoping and and design does that answer the point Mazur, uh, Mansour? Mansour, hopefully it does uh, <laughs> unfortunately we don't have audio for people but hopefully it does uh, uh, let me go ahead and uh, uh, say a couple of things firstly uh, we are at the bottom of the hour so some people may need to leave so i'm going to go ahead and ask for a poll to be shown to people uh, just to rate the session. I'd love to get your feedback on the session. And in the meantime, Andy, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, a couple of more questions, if you're okay, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, sort of keep the discussion going. Uh, one of this is a favorite topic for me, as well as many others uh, who use Swift Kanban, as well as uh, just general Kanban, which is about the, you mentioned about the work. This is a question from Stuart Gibbons and uh, the, uh, question is about uh, moving work backwards. So you mentioned about work items not moving backward, which is a principle uh, uh, Stuart also follows. Uh, but it's hard to give explain to the team why. Uh, typical example: uh, we have we have a column for dev, a column for test. The natural response is to move an item back if a bug is found in testing. Uh, do you have a succinct and convincing explanation as to uh, why not to move items backwards on a Kanban board? So um, I. It's it's one of my motivations for doing this this um, this webinar really. Um, I seem to have lost um, uh, the video of you, Mahesh, and I don't know whether um, people lost the video of me, but um, I'm carrying on assuming that you can see me. Uh, Good point. I know I don't think I can see you, and the thing looks like mine is also gone. But oh, the, you've just re you've just returned. Just... You have returned. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the okay. poll being asked uh, that uh, took us off. Right. Um, so, um, so why don't we why do we allow stuff going backwards? And and how do you avoid stuff going backwards is the other question. Because um, you say, well, hang on a minute. Um, I've got a column for code review, and um, so I've finished the programming. It goes into code review, and then the column after that is testing or acceptance or whatever. Okay. So it's gone into code review. Um, so the code reviewer says, yeah, uh, this is good, but would you change these these things or you're not following standards here? Whatever. So where do you put it then? You put it backwards in, in programming, right? These are not states in a Kanban board. These are not Kanban states. They're perfectly, I mean, they are states of the work item. And so you could say, because a state is just a general thing of what data do we have on this item? We can tell it's currently waiting for code review or in code review. So, um, the point is we don't use those as columns or states in the sequence of activities in the Kanban board. The, it is basically part of, um, pr of development, you know, the development phase. And we, we may inter interact between code review and programming, but it's all part of the same state that that is in. 
And the reason is because we want to see this flow, right? Moving to code review doesn't move us forward. It's just a different aspect of development. It's not moving us forward to now we're ready for user testing and it goes off to a different group um, or it ha happens in a in a different way and i'm working with a different group of people now because the dominant activity is user testing rather than um, development of a new feature so um, if you follow that rule um, and, and where you find okay well i want to have another column and it oscillates between it you want to group those two columns together I would prefer to see them, and I don't know whether you, you can do this, Mahesh, in, in Swift Kanban, uh, but I know uh, many tools that I've used don't, do not support this. I would like to have a swim lane within the column so I can say, you know, those are the blocked items. And again, when they unblock, they stay in the column, they just move to it, uh, not in the blocked part of the column. Here's the code review swim lane in this column. And when it's finished with code review, it goes back into development and we is a different process to move it on to the next stage of that work item. So that way we get this simple view of a small number, of, you know, a manageable number of states that items go through and they go through in order. So when we get into say a testing phase, uh, state and we need development, we don't move the ticket back to development. Yeah. We're working in the testing phase because that's where we found the bug. And now we're doing some development work in the testing phase of that work item which will help to complete it and say, well, it's completed testing because we found some bugs and we fix them in the testing phase. So it's just, again, a different way of looking at it. And if you think of it in terms of that knowledge acquisition um, metaphor, it's we went through the stage of development, but we didn't have enough knowledge of exactly how users will use it. We went into the phase of user testing and got more knowledge about how users, and then we found it wasn't good enough the way we had implemented it. So in the user testing thing, we do those changes to the system. It's not moving it backwards, it's move, it's it's getting the developers involved in a later stage than yeah. say, well, I'm in development, I only work in development. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's why, in, that's why we're trying to do it. And so the name that you give to those states is important. And the data that you get out at the end, this is the real point. You've done all this work to get the model and get the, get the states clear, but it's only so that then you can see what on earth is going on. And if you have those states where, um, so, so for example, how many bugs did you find after you said it was done? You know, that is it's very relevant. And used to testing actually work, resulted in more development work than in the development phase. So, Absolutely. I was just going to mention the the metrics aspect of it. That if you mm. are particularly focused on the uh, on the accurate uh, uh, understanding of uh, your data and and the metrics that you're showing, especially the ones that Andy talked about, then you want to not uh, do do the movement of card backward because the work that's really getting done at that point is is the fix of the defect rather than the actual code. So, but I but I know that uh, uh, it is uh, it is. Uh, it can be uh, it can it can take real discipline to sort of not do that and uh, um, uh, mm. you know not avoid the temptation of moving stuff backwards. Um, I just wanted to answer your question uh, about the fact that yes, we do support horizontal swim lanes. I just want to say uh, this is a perfect segue for me to <laughs> to plug my to plug the product a little bit. That I think pretty much everything that you talked about, uh, Andy, in the uh, especially about the metrics and uh, the different uh, charts that you showed. Uh, some of them have come directly based on your uh, our discussion with you, and they're part of our ESP uh, package that is on top of uh, Swift Kanban. So, yeah, we provide and also of course support to upstream Kanban and defining a specific commitment point. Mm -hmm. um, I know we are well past time, but I'm going to go ahead and ask a couple of more questions. So, one first, uh, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we will share the email, uh, we will share the link to the recording and slides uh, uh, in a follow-up email. So yes, those of you who asked that question. Um, Andy, you just want to make sure that we uh, did get your uh, get the slide uh, when you're pointing, and we couldn't see your pointer, that the commitment point was the raising of the PO, right? That's what you're referring to. Uh, right, where was it? Where was I, can, I can put that slide up, and that would possibly be useful. Um, so uh, do you need to ask me to share my screen again? Yes. Uh, screen. Yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, um, so I think it was here. Now, um, 
Right. So right after the the I mean the the, the once the PO was issued, then that was completed. Correct. There you go. So um, there's a question mark in a, in a sense of is the commitment part actually here? <laughs> mm. I nearly changed this slide before this presentation, you know that, because like, obviously I do change slides just before a presentation. And I thought, <laughs> no, I won't, because nobody will ask that, nobody will notice that. But of course, it's a very relevant question of where is the commitment point, even though we think the commitment point is in the wrong place. So here is the point at which we've got a, P a PO. You say we've finished this lot, it's been through finance, all the rest of it, we've got a PO. So I think really what we mean is the commitment point is here. We've got a PO. And so time and implementation, we can count from as soon as a subcontractor has got the purchase order. They may have internal queues, they may not have people ready, they may not want to pull it. So they may have a buffer of POs that we haven't started yet. But as far as we're concerned, the system lead time should start from the PO. So that was what I was saying. That's so, so if you'll just excuse the sort of roughly the uh, commitment point and the PO, yeah, it's around this point. But um, if I redrew this uh, this slide, I think I would put it here, because when we give the PO, uh -huh. and the finance department ask can't ask for it back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You've got a PO, you know. Yes. Do it happen. So it, it might, we might have agreement with the with the subcontractor that if they haven't started yet, um, right. then we can have it back. But you know, in, in real terms, it's the commitment point, yeah. and we wouldn't give them the we wouldn't give them the PO if we've got other stuff which we think, well, that one might be more important. We might want that to go in ahead of something else, so we won't give them these POs. We'll wait till that one comes in, okay. and and give them that as well. So there's, there could be some way in which you manage the commitment point there. The more complex point and one which I wouldn't is, is perhaps more advanced is that we we discovered that we haven't we aren't protecting the bottleneck because the bottleneck is upstream. And the fact that the bottleneck is upstream um that, that that's really where we got to we got to focus on how we how we address that problem because um the yeah and uh, <laughs> and probably at least include solution design right. uh, in the system and that might mean renegotiating a contract in some way that we pay the subcontractor for their work in solution design and um, oh. even if we decide not to do that work right um so um you know that's that's why I say some of these these things in terms of the way the Kanban system works and where, you know the problems it reveals may not just be problems about flow or delays or yeah, so too like, much work in progress or whatever. It may actually revolve well. Actually, we need to renegotiate the contract in some way um, to make that work better. Yeah, I, and you mentioned that I, I I in fact wrote it down. You said the contractual model is affected by the implementation of uh, of Kanban and and vice versa. A, a, yeah. Uh, the way that the contractual model is implemented also defines where your commitment point needs to be. So. Yeah, and I think we've seen this all through with Agile. Uh -huh. um, it, Agile and fixed price models do not are not good bedfellows. Really, they don't they don't go well together. Yep. And um, so there are reasons why government procurement, for example, moved away from cost plus. You know. Okay. Um, and it's very difficult to control and they weren't getting value for money. In this situation here, we only have one subcontractor. So there's no competition. Um, and so how, you know, I don't know how they do the price control. Oh, okay. um, you know, whether there's another part of the organization which is saying, well, we'll do a costing as well. But <laughs> it, it's, not a, it's not a suitable system for fixed price, is my opinion. Um, which yeah, yeah. is probably more than I should say in a seminar, but um, uh, but yeah. but certainly we have to look at the contractual models that we have if we want a flow system to work well, because in this case, the reason the subcontractor is reluctant to get involved in solution design is because they don't get paid for it. Yeah, Particularly if the yeah. customer says, if the customer says, well, it costs that much, we don't want to do it. Yeah, well, we, that's why <laughs> we don't want to do solution design. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
Yeah. So uh, um, one of the reasons why uh, I think in the in the Indian IT industry, which I'm which we are familiar with because we have some pretty large customers there, I think the the mm -hmm. whole advent of ado adoption of agile was has been delayed this exactly for these reasons. So, yeah. Uh, they, they 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 don't go well together at all. Uh, anyway, so I, I I hate to say this, but there are uh, there are, we have well past time, and I have to end this unfortunately. Uh, so there are a few questions that we didn't answer, and Andy, I'm going to send those to you, uh, and uh, I will I'll request uh, people who are uh, who are uh, whose questions are not answered to uh, certainly reach out to us, and uh, you know um, I'm going to share my uh, my. Uh, contact just, slide again hope you can see that just yeah. on on this slide on the contacts it is actually if you if you say andy at huge huge dot io that is a more convenient email address for me to deal with business queries so andy at huge h-u-g-e dot io um, okay. so so that's um, a better one if you want to contact me directly rather than than that personal email address. But and I will make sure to share that email address if you don't mind in the follow-up email so that people know where to uh, Sure. Um, and andy.carmichael at huge.io also works, but the shortest okay. one is andy at huge.io. Okay. Good. And Andy, yeah. As always, a pleasure, uh, always ours, and uh, thank you so much for doing this webinar. Uh, I think it gives a lot of people a lot of uh, food for thought, uh, certainly us as well. And I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to connect with you afterwards to discuss with you more. So maybe I'll get uh, some people in my company to join as well. Cool. Very good to talk to you, Mahesh, and everyone else okay. that I can't see. Yep. You. Thank you so much uh, to everybody. Yeah, absolutely, for staying on till this late. And uh, thank you for attending the webinar. And uh, uh, hopefully, we'll see you in one of our uh, next webinars. I think end of the end of the year, we have a webinar by mid, in mid-December by David Anderson. And so... Uh, Hopefully you'll join some of uh, uh, the upcoming webinars. Thanks a lot and have a great rest of the day. Uh, and Andy, you too. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.